Before I pass the baton over to uh, Bishop Alain, just wanted to give you a tiny little bit of context. Um, when uh, Bishop Tom took over at the Office of English Pastoral Services in 2011, one of the first things he did was a series of parish visitations. And in the context of that, uh, he and the team of the uh, OEPS at the time realized that many parishes were expressing a desire to not only survive, but to thrive, but to, to really grow into a sense of who they are and to really embrace their missionary vocation. So ever since 2014, we've uh, sponsored a parish vitality conference. Those of you who have good memories will remember that it, the team from Rebuilt with Father Michael White and Tom Corcoran came in 2014 um, to speak about parish revitalization. In 2016, Deacon Keith Strom came from the Catherine of Siena Institute to talk about discerning and releasing our gifts. And in 2018, we had Father James Mallon from the Divine Renovation Movement to speak to us about leadership. And it's, I think it's very much in that continuity, uh, but also in partnership with the entire diocese and the Chantier Diocesain that we are following, that um, uh, we are having these two events today, one event in two moments that Bishop uh, Du Rocher is gonna be leading both of them. So I'm gonna pass the torch over to Bishop Alain and he's gonna make a little bit of a connection to what we're doing now and the diocesan uh, project. Thank you, Father Ray. Thank you so much. Um, and good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure and a true joy for me to be with you today. Uh, there, is a, there is a story being told about Pope Paul VI. Um, after Vatican II, the council, uh, some accused him of neglecting and abandoning uh, old traditions of the church. And he is said to have replied, don't get me wrong. I love traditions. I love them so much, I create new ones. Allora, si non è vero e ben trovato, this is a bit uh, what we're doing today. Two beautiful fall traditions converged into one event that has all on the same page. Uh, Parish Vitality Conference, of course, and the Office for Faith Education, Ressourcement of Catechists. We had this idea, I had this idea before, it was, remember that time, it was before the pandemic, I don't know if you remember. Uh, we had this idea to bring close to one another, those two events, to give a signal that we have to manifest that we are one church at grassroots level. And together with UAPS and uh, ODEF, we were looking for a keynote speaker for a Friday night event who would, could help us, who could help us uh, come together in mission before Saturday workshops that could concentrate on specific issues and topics for either uh, OEPS or ODEF. And, and, and we came up with the perfect keynote speaker in Archbishop Paul André, fluent, of course, in English and French, who had just published in both languages an essay on baptism, confirmation, church, and mission. So here we are this morning in English and this afternoon in French. We say on the same page of the same book. We may have to admit that there are still barriers when it comes to language in our church, but there are no barriers to common witness to the gospel and to common service in our neighborhoods. And this is actually a main goal of our diocesan chantier of, transform of missionary transformation. So looking forward, I hope this event and many more to come built on the same premises will help us be truly together in mission, ensemble en mission. Thank you. We now ask Kim, our Director of Social Action, to lead us in our moment of prayer. This is a passage from the Gospel of St. Luke. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down, all of the eyes of people in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. pleasure to, uh, to introduce you, Archbishop Paul-André Rocher, Archbishop of Gatineau, Quebec. Uh, Paul-André, it's a pleasure for us to have you with us. Um, you were born in Windsor, Ontario in 1954 and grew up in Timmins before attending the University of Western Ontario, where you completed a Bachelor of Musical Arts, speciali specializing in vocal performance. Paul-André then attended St. Paul University in Ottawa, and he completed there a Bachelor for Theology in 1981 and a Master's of Art in Theology in 1985. He simultaneously completed the Bachelor of Education degree at the University of Ottawa. Paul-André was ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Timmins in July 1982. He taught high school and served in various parishes. He eventually was named Episcopal Vicar for Pastoral and Sacramental Affairs and Director of the Chancery there. He completed the civil licentiate in canon law with the University of Strasbourg, France in 1992. And during a sabbatical year in 1995-96, he attended the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome and completed there his ecclesiastical licentiate in theology. The following year, Pan André was uh, named the uh, titular Bishop of Ausuaga and Auxiliary Bishop of Sault Ste. Marie, a place we, we come to, to know a bit then, Ontario. He, or, he was ordained to the episcopacy in, on March 14, 1997, and when it was entrusted with the pastoral leadership of the French sector of the diocese uh, of, and of the native parishes in the Manitoulin North Shore area of the diocese of Saint Marie. In 2002, he was named diocesan bishop of Alexandria, Cornwall, where he remained for nine years. During that time, he served at, uh, on the Education Commission of the Assembly of Catholic Bishops of Ontario 
and was elected to the executive committee of the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops. On November 30, 2011, he was installed as the Archbishop of Gatineau, Quebec. He served as president of the CCCB from 2013 to 2015. He continues to serve the CCCB as a delegate to the National Jewish Catholic Dialogue and as a member of the Standing Committee for Responsible Ministry. He's also a member uh, of the Assembly of Catholic Bishops, of course, and he serves there on the Executive Committee as well on the Conseil Communauté et Ministère for Communities and Ministries. He has been a member of the Pontifical Council for Culture since 2014. In 2017, he published a three volume set of introductions to the Psalms. And in 2018, he completed a series of litur liturgical songs entitled Mess Getsinoise. In 2019, he launched this new book under the title Call by Name, Sent in His Name. And this is um, a true joy to have you with us, Paul Andre. Thank you for being with us and sharing your wisdom. Thank you very much, Alain. It's a pleasure for me to be with you. I hope everybody can hear me well. If you can just kind of nod saying, yes, you hear me there, I'd appreciate that. If I, great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen. So just uh, please bear with me for a moment uh, so that I don't make any mistakes. <laughs> um, and uh, here we go. Uh, so normally you should be getting this uh, presentation here. Okay, so uh, what you're seeing right now, if everything is working well, is uh, the cover of my book uh, called by name, sent in his name, Reflections on an Outward Bound Church. Uh, just a word about the history of the book in a sense, what I've done in this book is I've tried to answer two questions that have been with me for many, many, many years. When I started studying uh, theology, I was very much interested in the theology of the sacraments. And uh, one of the issues that kept on coming up was the, uh, the understanding of what confirmation is. Somebody once uh, quipped that confirmation is a sacrament in search of a theology. And it's, uh, it's kind of true. Everybody has kind of their own idea of what the meaning of confirmation is. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is kind of vague. It says confirmation is a sacrament which strengthens baptism. I've always kind of felt, um, how can I say, frustrated by that answer because it seems to imply that there's something lacking in baptism that needs another sacrament to strengthen it. But at any rate, uh, so that is one question. What is the relationship between baptism and sacrament uh, and confirmation? And the second question that I've carried with me since, uh, since my ordination as a bishop is, what is the church about? Why does the church exist? What is the purpose of the church? And uh, slowly, it uh, kind of became much more specific. What is the, what is the um, ministry of the church? What is its mission? Uh, what is it called to do, to be? And when I say the church, I'm talking about communities, parishes. What is the point of a parish? What are parishes supposed to be doing? What is a parish's mission? And I know that various parishes have given themselves uh, mission statements or vision statements and have worked on that, but is there something that grounds the, 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 the mission of the church in a general way? And so this book is my effort to answer both those questions because uh, especially with Pope Francis, whose emphasis on, you know, the, the church as a missionary community and the members of the church as disciple missionaries, disciple missionaries, I realized corresponded to my understanding of, of what it means to be both baptized and to be confirmed. And basically to be, a, to be baptized, it's to be a disciple and to be confirmed is to become a missionary. That's the way I see it. And this is what I try to explain in this book. And by the way, you can order it at uh, Novalis English uh, Services. Go on their website and you can uh, get a paper copy or an ebook copy if what I'm going to present to you this morning uh, kind of invites you to go further in this reflection with me. 
Um, the other thing I'd like to say is this book does not give recipes. It doesn't give answers. I'm sorry, if you're here to find answers this morning, I'm not going to be of much help. What it tries to do is give uh, a structure of thought to organize our thoughts around what it means to be uh, disciples, missionaries, disciple missionaries, what it, what it means to be uh, a missionary church, a church that has engaged itself on this missionary journey. And this is why the subtitle is Reflections on an Outward Bound Church. So if I can give an example, um, I, I've been, you know, I'm not a great cook, but I enjoy when I have the chance going in the kitchen. And one of the things I've learned about a salad dressing is whatever your recipe for a salad dressing is, you need three key ingredients. You need some kind of oil. You need some kind of acidic uh, liquid. And, and, and you need something to give it taste, spices or herbs. So those are the three things you need. Now, what kind of oil? Well, this is where recipes start varying from one place to another. What kind of acidic, you know, is it vinegar? Is it orange? Uh, might, maybe it is orange juice or lemon juice, whatever. What kind of vinegar? And then, you know, the, the spices and the herbs. And this is why we have thousands of recipes, but all the recipes have this in common, that they have these three key ingredients. What my book tries to do, and what I'm going to try to do this morning, is give you the key ingredients. Now, each person in his or her life has to find how those ingredients choose among the various components. Uh, possibilities of those ingredients and how do I blend them together and and this is each individual's vocation each individual Christian kind of has his or her own uh, uh, take on this but the key ingredients are always there and it's the same for parishes outward bound parishes always focus have to focus on the same ingredients now how you focus on them, which, how do you choose them, how do you combine them and everything, will give each parish kind of its, its own particular regard, its own particular taste, and especially because of the, the, the context in which that parish is being lived, you know, a parish that lives in a rich neighborhood is not going to look like a parish in a poor neighborhood, not just because the people in one parish are rich and the people in the other are poor, but because their mission is expressed differently because of the milieu in which they are uh, living. So let's let's get into this because I've only got uh, 20 minutes left. <laughs> so so uh, baptism and, and what I've done uh, fundamentally is gone back to Luke's gospel the story of Jesus's baptism and what happens, the key in Jesus's baptism. Yes, he goes into the water, John the Baptist plunges him into the water, but the key is this heavenly voice. The spirit comes down and then the heavenly voice proclaims, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. You are my son. And when right after that, the, Luke says the spirit pushes him into the desert as if he's going on a retreat, but during this time of reflection on the experience that he's just lived in the baptism, he's tempted by the tempter, by the devil. And the tempter uses these words. He starts his temptations by saying, well, if you really are the son of God, he's calling into question what God said. You know, God said, you are my son. And the, the devil says, are you really his son? If you're really his son, then you should be able to do this, you should be able to do that. So both his baptism and his temptation focus on a question of identity. It answers the question, who am I? And if Jesus were among us right now, and I, and I asked him, Jesus, you know, you are the Christ, you are our savior, you are, you know, a great teacher. But fundamentally, deep down, who are you? His answer would be, I am the beloved son of my father. This is his fundamental identity, okay? And I think this is, let's remember this, identity. Who am I? It's a question everybody asks themselves at one point because we have so many roles in our lives. You know, I look at myself, uh, so I'm the Archbishop of Gatineau, uh, but, I'm, but I'm also 
the son of Maurice and Lucille, and I'm the brother of, you know, uh, five other guys and a girl, you know, I'm, I'm their brother. And, and when I sing in the choir, well, I'm, I'm a chorister with the other choristers. Uh, so, so I have all these roles. Who am I deep down? It's a question I think all of us struggle with. Um, or at least maybe we should. Now, after the desert experience, this is the second move here. After the desert experience, according to Luke, Jesus goes to Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue and there he picks up. And this is where I, I suggested that for our, uh, our prayer this morning, we take up this text, which is proclaimed at the chrism mass every year, proclaimed at the chrism mass. And he proclaims the prophecy of Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me he, to bring good news to the poor he has sent me. Now, look at the, the, the shift here from the baptism scene. It's true that in the baptism scene, the, the spirit of the Lord came upon him. The words, and he says that, in your hearing today, these words are made fulfilled, are fulfilled. So he's saying these words written by the prophet Isaiah 500 years ago apply to me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit came upon me and anointed me. Why did he anoint me? To bring good news to the poor. He sent me and he goes on to bring freedom to the captives and sight to the blind and uh, proclaim a year of God's favor. He sent me. So, so at the baptism scene, it's, it, it's a, a voice from heaven. It's a heavenly voice. Here, it's the voice of scripture. It's the scriptural voice that does not answer the question, who are you? But not who am I? But the question, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What is my mission? Do you, do you see that connection between, between the, the, the baptism scene and the the, the the temptation, and then in the synagogue, when Jesus goes to the synagogue. These two questions are foundational. And I would suggest to you that in baptism, we are given our identity, and in confirmation, we are given our mission. In the same way that, that Jesus kind of... Now, the two, the two are not separate realities. For Jesus, his purpose his mission flows out of his identity, and his identity is, you know, to, to be uh, involved in this mission. Um, Hans Urs von Balthasar, one of the great theologians of the 20th century, said, only in Jesus do identity and mission completely uh, mesh together to be one reality. Jesus is the one who is sent, and he is sent because of who he is, the beloved son of God. So in our baptism, what I'm saying is we are given our identity. We are conformed to Jesus, the beloved son. So we become beloved sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters to each other. Now, some people will say, well, aren't, aren't we all God's children? Aren't we all sons and daughters of God? You know, those who are baptized and those who are not baptized, isn't God the source of all life, so aren't all human beings children of God? And, and this is true in, in a certain sense, it is true. It, it, it's true in the sense that uh, our, our very lives depend upon God. But I've, if I can take an analogy, that, that would be like saying I'm the son of Maurice and Lucille because, um, you know, uh, uh, Maurice knew Lucille and knew Lucille gave birth and she begat me, you know, and in that sense, I'm their son. But unfortunately, in this world, people have children and then for one reason or another, it can be, there can be many reasons, uh, the connection or the relationship is not fulfilled. And, and you know, take adoption where a, a, a child is adopted by a couple and he grows in a relationship with another couple, not those who are his biological parents, but his other parents. And, and these parents become his true parents because he has this relationship with them, a relationship of love, a relationship of care. That child knows that he or she is loved by these parents and reciprocates that love. It's, it's a relationship. 
So this is what God wants for us. God wants us to enter into this relationship with God. You know what in the in the uh, Old Testament and New Testament we speak about a covenant relationship, but Jesus spoke about a filial relationship that God is my father and he can be your father. God wants to be your father. And as I say to kids, a father who loves us like the best mother in the world, you know, a father who loves us with a mother's heart. So, so, so this relationship is what is specific about baptism. It's the, we enter into this relationship, a relationship that we are called to develop for the rest of our lives. So that's, that's, so in a sense, all people are the children of God because they, they are from God. But God wants more than that. God wants a relationship with us. And this is where baptism enters us, makes us enter into that relationship in, by being conformed to Jesus, whose identity is to be the beloved son. And so baptism answers the question of who am I? I am the beloved son. I am the beloved daughter of God. And, and this is my destiny to be, this is all our destiny to be the beloved children of God. But in confirmation, this um, identity issues forth into a mission. In confirmation, we are conformed to Jesus, the Christ. Christ means the anointed one. He said, the, whole, the spirit is upon me because he has anointed me. And so in confirmation, we are anointed. And we are sent into the world with Jesus to bring good news. And that's why I asked, you know, I suggested that we, that we uh, play that song, Here I Am, Lord, you know, which is often sung at funerals for, you know, I guess just because of the line, I've heard you calling in the night. But it's not a funeral song. It's a song about being confirmed, about hearing God's voice saying, who am I going to send to the world? if not my brothers and sisters? Who will take up my mission with me to the world? And what I'm saying about baptism and confirmation that gives our identity and our mission is true about our communities also. Our communities have an identity rooted in our relationship with Jesus, but we have a mission to the world. Each community has to live out that mission to the world. That's what it means to engage the missionary conversion that the Pope calls us to. You know, so, so for example, take up the prayer, the Our Father, that we say all the time. In the first line, we are proclaiming our identity as the beloved children of God. We are calling God our Father. You in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May you be known. Your name is father, mother, parent, loving, caregiver for all of us. You know, this is, this is who you are and this is who we are. We are your children. So we proclaim our identity and then our purpose, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as in heaven. This is our purpose to strive for the coming of the kingdom of justice, peace, and joy, so that God's will is done on earth as well as it is done in heaven. In heaven, it is done perfectly, but it needs to be done here on earth. And then we express the needs that we have in order to live out our identity and our mission, our purpose. We need this daily bread, the daily bread, the physical bread, but the bread of his word you know, and the bread of the Eucharist, and to forgive us our trespasses, and to not lead us into temptation, and to deliver us from evil. This is, these are the conditions that, that, are, that, that we need in order to be able to live our identities and develop our purposes. And so let's, uh, two questions, how can we grow in our identity and our mission, and how can our faith communities help us grow in our identity and our missions, okay? So these are the two questions. So this talk here is as much about each of us individually as it is about our faith communities, because our communities are places where we gather to, to live out our identity, to grow in our identity, but also to enact our mission. So, so there's, this, there's this twofold movement in our gathering. And 
I just want to say that it is expressed in an interesting way at mass, when we gather for mass, which we say is the source and the summit of you know, the Christian life, of the church's life. But when we gather, we make the sign of the cross. This is the sign of the cross of the children of God coming together to grow in relationship with God. But at the end, we are sent and we are blessed and we make a second sign of the cross. And this is the, sacri the, the, the sign of the cross of the confirmed, the disciples, those who are going out now into the world to live that mission. So I often say that the church should not be seen as a kind of a restaurant, even much less a fast food restaurant, where I simply come to be nourished and then go back home spiritually filled. But we have to see our communities as a, a meals on wheels, a place where we come to get food, but this food is not just for us, it is meant for others. And so when we leave the church, we have this task of bringing the food that we've just received to bring it to others. So, so you see how there's this double movement. So at the heart of it is Jesus, okay? At the heart of it is Jesus. And, and what I want to say is about the three ingredients here. So it's, it's not acidic and oil and spices. It's about being prophet priest and king. Prophet corresponds to, to my, my speaking. Uh, uh, priest corresponds to my being and king corresponds to my doing. So, so it's kind of the three fundamental aspects of the human being. Who I am, what I say, and what I do. You know, So in order to grow in my relationship with Jesus, so moving towards Jesus, in terms of, of saying, of speech, of prophet, the prophet, Jesus as prophet, I want to abide in his word. So I need to grow in the knowledge of his word. This is, this is a, scripture has to become alive to me. And my community has to be a, become a place where scripture can become alive to me. Uh, obviously, you know, we gather for mass and we proclaim the scripture and there's homilies and everything. And, 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 and and that is wonderful, that is essential, that is essential, but it's not sufficient, you know, because I need, uh, I really need for God's word to truly become alive in my life. And, and this is a big challenge for each of us individually, and it's a challenge for us as a community. Are we really people of the word, you know, that that's that's one of the big challenges. So in parishes, we gather for faith study, we gather for Bible study, for we, we, we have small groups, uh, you know, uh, Bible sharing groups, we have catechesis for children, for adults. The, all of these are efforts to abide in his word, to help people abide in his word. That's, that's priest, that, that's the prophet. The king aspect, the, the, because in the Old Testament, the king was the one who was in charge of making the people uh, grow in, in peace and in love. It's, it's the kingdom of God, justice, peace, and joy, coming together to live that. So we grow in our love for each other within the community, in our, in our sharing, in our caring for, for each other in the community. That's, that is a bit more of a challenge, you know? How often do I go into uh, a parish to celebrate a confirmation on a weekday evening? And I ask, are there any parishioners here? And there are no parishioners, except for those who led, you know, the catechetical process. And if I, I know that if I see a parishioner, why didn't you come to the confirmation the other night? Well, it didn't concern me. Well, what does this mean about loving my brothers and sisters in the community of faith? Now, I'm just giving that, that's just a symptom. God, when the Knights of Columbus and the Daughters of Isabella fight over who gets this room, where's, where's this love for my brothers and sisters? Or, or the, care, the care or concern for the people around me? Uh, somebody who, who left the Catholic Church and joined the Evangelical Church once told me, I asked, why did, why did you go there? He said, you know, when, when I uh, was sick at the hospital, when I was a Catholic, uh, the priest came to see me to bring me communion one day. When I joined the evangelical church and I ended up in hospital, 20 members of the community came to see me during the four days that I was there. That's loving my brothers and sisters in the faith. That's an expression of it at any rate. So how do we do that? And then at the level of my being, you know, if, if my, 
identity is to be a loving, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a, a beloved son, daughter of God, then I need to grow in my intimacy with God. I need to grow in my relationship with Jesus. And this is prayer and this is liturgy. So, so we see here kind of the three fundamental dimensions of baptism. How do we live it out in community through love for each other, through uh, abiding in God's word, and through growing in prayer and liturgy together with each other. Now, most communities are doing this, at least to some extent. Most communities are doing this to some extent. The challenge and this is why we need a missionary conversion, is to live our confirmation. And this is the next slide here. Here, the arrows, if you see, they are pointing out, they are pointing out to the world. And this is how I become a, a, a missionary disciple. This is how I live out my confirmation. This is how I become an outward bound church. And again, I go back to priest, prophet, and king. So let's start with prophet up on the left-hand side there, the word of God. I, I'm growing in abiding in the word of God through my baptism, through my belonging to this community. But now the word isn't just for me. I'm sent to bring this gospel into the world. I, I'm sent to proclaim the good news. This is evangelization, to help others discover the joy of this good news, as Jesus did, as the apostles did. St. Peter has, to, has this beautiful line in, um, in one of his letters, I forget which one, I think it's the first, always be ready to give the reason for your hope. Can we do this? Uh, and sometimes we miss the chance to do that. I remember one evening I was with this couple and at, at a dinner party and we spent the whole evening arguing about all the problems in the church. And at the end, they left not convinced and I left frustrated. But I realized I missed the chance. I said, you know, can we ta stop talking about the problems of the church? Can I tell you why I am a Christian? What it means to me to be a Christian? Can I tell you who Jesus is for me? Can we talk about this for a moment? I missed my chance to share the gospel. And we all, all of us, each member of the church has to be able to do that. And we need to be shaped to be able to do that. And a parish has to be shaping its members to do this. And the parish has to be, be engaged in doing this actively. And then on, on the upper right-hand side, to humanize the world. This is, we're, we're growing in love with each other in the community, but this love can't be given for ourselves. I, I remember this evening when I was up in Timmins, we, we, we would have once a month a mass for Curcista. Some of you might have lived the Curcio. It was beautiful. We loved each other. We'd hug each other. It was the place where we learned to give hugs, you know, at the sign of the peace. It was beautiful. It was such a great uh, family of caring and loving. And, and one night we were in the church and all of a sudden we heard noise back to the church and somebody came in who was obviously drunk. So a couple of the members of the community got up, you know, accompanied the drunk person outside of the church, then closed the doors and locked them so we would no longer be bothered so we could continue living our nice, beautiful, little, loving fraternity. My brothers and sisters, I don't know what technically what we could have done. Maybe it was the right thing to do on the spot. But if that's the symbol of what our church is, then we are not living up to the mission that Jesus has entrusted to the church and to each one of us. We are called to go out and to commit ourselves to the well-being of the poor. And poverty comes in so many different forms and aspects. We need to be listening to the cries of the poor around us. And as communities, asking ourselves, how can we respond to that? How can we respond to that? And often we can't do it alone. I think in our society, particularly, there are, there are people uh, of goodwill who set up community organizations to do this, just to be out there on the front lines with them, supporting them, co collaborating with them. It doesn't have to be a Catholic thing to be doing this. But we do it, we do it in the name of Christ. And finally, my, my time is coming to an end. I need to shine with holiness in the midst of the world at the level of my being. It's what I call the liturgy in the world. And, and for this, I invite you to go meditate. I write on it in my book, uh, Romans 12, 
uh, one and two, one to three. Uh, Romans, the 12th chapter, verse one to three. I don't have time to go into it, but go read it and go reflect on it and, and get my book and go read what I've said on it. But basically my liturgy, I, I, we gather a church to pray and to celebrate the liturgy, but then there's a liturgy I need to live in the world. And that's who I am shining in the midst of the world through my attitudes, my values, and my virtues. You know, so that so that even without saying or doing anything, people who meet me say there's something different about that gal or that guy. To, holiness is nothing else than my identity as a beloved son of God shining within me. You know, so and and we need to learn as Christian communities to be that kind of as a community, a witness in my neighborhood, you know, to the to the life and to the presence of a loving God. How can we do that? The huge challenges. So I'm not answering the questions. You see, I'm not giving you the, I'm just giving you the kind of instructions that we need. So just going back, Jesus at the heart of it, who is priest, prophet, and king invites us to abide in his word, to love my brothers and sisters, and to grow in intimacy with God. This is the baptismal dimension of my, my life as a Christian. It's the baptismal dimension of parish life. The challenge, the real challenge for us is to live the community, the, 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 the missionary dimension, to really be out an outward bound church. And so there we go. That kind of summarizes in a nutshell, you know, what I, I, I could have gone on, but the time is up and uh, we'll move on now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Paul Andre, for the, sharing those words with us. Um, I was told by the animators that if you had, if you, if you wanted to take another minute or two for closing remarks, we would, we would certainly give you that time. But if you feel that you've brought it to a close, then we can move on to the response. It's well, perhaps, Ray, just to add this, and uh, I will have time to respond to some of the uh, questions or comments that, that are raised later, but I would just add this, that for me, this, this vision impacts everything about parish life. Every, it's not a question of starting new pro programs. It's a question of looking at everything we do and asking ourselves, how can we make this missional? This is the question. And so in my book, my last two chapters, um, I speak about a parish picnic. A lot of parishes hold a picnic, you know, social activity. How can we make a picnic in a way that helps people to grow in their identity and to respond to their mission? And I just kind of throw out ideas. And then I do the same thing with the Eucharist. How can we celebrate the Eucharist in a way that brings out the missional and, and identity aspect, uh, the church gathered and the church sent? So, so I can't go into details, but for me, it's not a question of starting new programs, but of reviewing everything we're doing in that light. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, chapter part four of the book is indeed called Picnics and Eucharist. And uh, if you read it, you're going to see the connection very clearly. And it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. Um, one of the beautiful things about our diocesan church and about the church in general is the amazing gifts that very committed uh, lay people bring to parish ministry. And we've invited two of them to give an immediate response to, uh, to Archbishop de Roche's remarks and to uh, maybe uh, share how they've touched them in a particular way. So we have Louise Cormier from St. Luke's Parish, and we have Kevin Reda, uh, who's a youth minister at Holy Name of Jesus Parish in Laval. So we'll ask Louise to, uh, to, to say a few words with us to, in response right now. Monseigneur du Rocher. Ça va Hello, okay. Ah, for an introvert, uh, you gave me a lot of things there. It's all in my head, and they're asking me to react here. Um, I've read your book. 
So uh, that gave me a little bit of a head start, thank God, because what you gave really needs to be unpacked, especially on, I think, on a community base. I think on the personal side, um, we have a little bit that gut instinct, even though maybe many of us were not brought. Uh, I think in your book, one of the examples I liked is baptism about teaching how to walk and confirmation about how to ride a bike. And if as a parent, you know, you've ran behind the bike of your child and he held it and found a hard time to let it go and you let it go and they break their neck or have boo-boos and whatever. And, you know, it's very stressful. Um, and I think sometimes maybe in the past, our church has not been able to maybe let us go a little bird, fly, fly. And if you make a mistake, it's okay. We'll start over. We'll work together. So I think that's where we are maybe at the church now is as a community, how then do we, how do we do this? Um, that's the challenge because we're very well um, seated and rested and the way we've done things. So there are some people who are very engaged at, at those different levels, but most of us might not be so much. Um, so the, I think, for me, what strikes to me now is how are we going to be intentional? I think you summed it up in the last part as, you know, um, we're going to have to sit down and think about it. And I think COVID-19, I'm going to bring us back to our reality, is an opportunity to look at some of the things or that we didn't do. And we still have time because we're still stuck in COVID-19. It didn't last us a few months like we thought. So what can we do to be intentional to be that kind of people to others, to take care of our brothers and sisters. Christmas is coming up. There are a lot of people. So I think there are so many opportunities that we need to explore as communities. But how do you mobilize the community that to, to challenge there? I find I'm back working in a community, assisting my pastor as a pastoral associate. And it's overwhelming to um, change that culture. And um, not everybody is there. We have a lot of immigrants who are coming from totally different church cultures as well. And that's an additional, for me, at least what I'm sensing, a, a different language that we need to bring to them uh, in that way. So I, <laughs> I could also say more, but I think I'm going to just leave it at that, my first gut reaction. I, I think you get a sense. I think everybody gets a sense of uh, where uh, where I'm at so um, the challenge of becoming true priests true prophet true kings within and without and what reminds me what you said I remember years ago I went to a conference in LA and one of the uh, speaker there if anybody asks you and he sang it and I remember if anybody asks you who you are tell them you're a child of God start with that and from there, forget if you're a lawyer or whatever, or just working for the church or whatever. If anybody asks you, and I still have the tune in my head, I can hear him. If anybody asks you who you are, tell them you're a child of God. So if nothing else, tell them that you're a child of God and live it out. Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. Thank you so much, Louise, for your passion and for your commitment to the gospel. And now we're going to hear from uh, Kevin Reda from Holy Name of Jesus Parish. Hi, Archbishop De Roche. It's really nice to, uh, to virtually meet you. Uh, I spent uh, the last few days reading your book. And I don't know, these are all the post-its that I put in your book because um, I'm a very slow reader, but I read the 200 pages within two days really quickly. And that's, a, that's an accomplishment for me. So uh, I was really inspired. And I really do challenge everyone to actually get the book because uh, I'm not getting any money for telling anyone to buy this book right now, by the way. Uh, but I really think it's worth reading because uh, it's, I've been spending the last five years really learning about what is parish vitality, what is evangelization. And I, re I think it's the first time I actually hear somebody talk about the sacraments and connecting them together with these key concepts. And it's, uh, it was mind blowing, at least for me, to actually piece things together. Okay, the puzzle actually fits together. Um, when reading your book, the big thing that I uh, really thought of was uh, uh, reflecting on is we have so many misconceptions about what is evangelization. Nobody, it seems that some people don't actually know what it means. 
and uh, and how to actually do it. You know, we just kind of say, go uh, evangelize, have fun. Uh, and really realizing that we actually don't train anyone to evangelize. We do, we don't do any of that. We just say, go evangelize, have fun. And there's so many potential negative uh, misconceptions about evangelization. And we, we struggle with that and with, with not knowing how to explain it from leaders. We can't communicate it to our communities. And, and then after they have this negative thing, and then they come to the next conference and, oh, the new evangelization, oh, like we already heard about it. It's so like old and ugh. like, I don't know. It's, it's but, but that's what's, uh, what I was reflecting on. And I'm realizing, uh, at least through your book is, I like how you said it through confirmation, we're called to be messengers. We don't have parishes that encourage a culture uh, of messengers. We encourage a, uh, a culture of create your own group and then keep that group together for the next 30 years until everyone passes away. Um, so uh, it's really, um, I'm really realizing it's that, you know, like I, it really was, my thought was, you know, we really create all these different groups in our parish. We create the men's group, the women's group, the book club. How about we create the men's group that actually forms three other men's groups, you know, and, and it actually, there's uh, three more. So really that was something that, was coming to mind. The other thing I thought of, because you really spoke about it in about baptism and baptism being about having a personal relationship and intimate relationship with Jesus. Um, I'm realizing we put a bunch of people that have, they don't even know if they have a personal relationship with Jesus in, in leadership roles. And then we're trying to tell them, okay, uh, help people make a personal relationship with Jesus. And they're not even sure themselves if they're able to uh, if they even have that, or even if they believe in the concept of having a personal uh, relationship uh, with Jesus. Um, and the, and realizing that these people don't, they don't know their story. They don't know when they had their big encounter. They don't know. And how are you supposed, and even you said, you need to know your story. You need to share your story with people. People need to hear, everyone loves a good story. And the story of us meeting Jesus is probably the best story we have, could ever tell in our, in our entire life. And if we don't even know when that, when it takes place, the beginning, middle of end, then uh, it just becomes a five minute cartoon sketch with somebody kind of like scratching their nose or something. Um, and the last thing that I was looking at, and I really like how you spoke about leadership, is um, our, our parish leadership needs to kind of change what's normative. We can't just expect the faithful to really know, okay, we need to put evangelization and missionary outreach at the forefront. Our leadership needs to um, to change what's normative. You know, we often, I often see working parish work, we're kind of like on a boat together, to, we're the rowing team, except on the rowing team, there's some people actually using rows, some people are using pool noodles to actually row. Some people are actually drinking lemonade and, and other people are, are, are like pressing an alarm bell and siring uh, things, you know? Uh, and we don't, we don't, like you said, we need to know what our purpose is. We need to be in unison, all of our ministries going together. And I really like how you said is we don't need to necessarily like start scrapping everything and say, oh, this program needs to go, this program needs to go, this program needs to go. It's what about if we look at all these different programs and talk about how can we make it and uh, what part of this program could be uh, evangelistic and and I'm realizing that even I remember sitting in a room saying okay let's look at all our programs and say which one is an evangelization tool and everyone in the room almost got offended that I I said hey you know like uh, like they might not be and they're like no 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 everyone and they were giving me reasons but I wasn't really sure if it was evangelization it was just like we're just going with I guess our gut was going and. Um, the last thing I want to say is, um, you know, somebody once told me, I was saying, you know, we're afraid of losing people if we change things, if we go in this missionary outlook. And I remember this person telling me really uh, and saying it with such a prophetic voice is if we lose them, did we ever have them? Did we ever have them? Did they really have their relationship already with God? So uh, just thank you for reminding us to know our identity, to know what is our call at baptism, then what is our call at confirmation? and to really go out and, um, and to evangelize, because that is the purpose of our church. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you very much. Wonderful. If you ever come to Gatineau, look me up. <laughs> so, uh, yes, thank you very much for, for <laughs> both uh, some of those insights and, and some of those questions. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, where, where do I start with this? 
Let, let me look at COVID, okay? A lot of us are, are living COVID. And let me try, I'm going to try to bring back my slide here. Uh, excuse me, see if I can do this without getting too complicated. Um, here we go, and I do this. And it's supposed to come uh, to the slide. There we go. Okay, this is what I wanted here. Okay, so so we're 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 experiencing COVID. So personally, if I use this structure, okay, for myself, uh, then I ask myself, me personally, how am I growing in my uh, in my relationship to God right now in intimacy? And perhaps COVID is calling me to renew a sense of deep personal prayer. Um, but also community prayer. How can I reach out to others to pray with them? So I'm, so I'm just asking for myself, you know, how can I do this? To abide in his word. How can I grow in the knowledge of scripture in, in, in the situation that I'm in? I probably don't have very little activities in the evening. Do I just fill out my activities with, you know, browsing the internet and watching TV? Uh, or, or do I try to take time to find some good text, some good resources to reflect on the word of God and, and to bring it into my life. And my brothers and sisters in the faith, how do I reach out to them in this COVID situation? The other members of my faith community, have I thought of calling some of the people? You know, if I'm a parishioner and I have a priest who's going through this, have I thought of giving him a call and saying, Father, how are you doing? Or if there's a lay pastoral associate who's in charge of programs, you know, and, and calling and saying, Martina, how, how's it going? How, how are you enduring through this? I mean, just showing that you care for them uh, because it's not easy. And other brothers and sisters in my community, maybe that I, 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 I see or that I know and that I haven't connected with, yet we try to connect with our families, but what about the members of our community? So, so you know, that's, that's growing in my identity as a child of God, but then the outreach, um, how can I humanize the world? What, what can I get involved with to respond to the cries of the world right now? Maybe it's simply kind of donating food to a local food bank or going out of my way to, to support a community organization that is doing things, or maybe joining at this point a community. Maybe I find I have more time to myself and, uh, and, and then uh, to shine with holiness through my evangelical attitudes, values, and virtues, which values, which virtues are called to, are challenged right now, personally, in my life? Which gifts of the spirit? Are, maybe it's patience. Maybe it's endurance. Maybe it's kindness. You know, I, I don't know what it is, you know, um, but, but I need to, to reflect on that so that it shows more with the people that I'm living with or the people that I'm in contact with. And then how can I give the reason for my hope to others, you know, chatting with anybody, you know, or communicating with anybody, or even I'll give you an example, very simple, you know, every, nearly everybody's on Facebook, uh, you know, or on Twitter or something. And when you read something that is inspiring, that speaks to you, share it, don't just like it. You know, liking is, oh, this is nice. Thank you for feeding me. Sharing it is feeding others. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm frustrated because I put a lot of stuff on, you know, I try, I try to feed the internet a lot, you know, with reflections on scripture and everything. I get a lot of likes, very few shares. And, and I keep on, why don't people just share it? It's not, you just got to click. And even that we say, well, yeah, my friends might not like it if I share it stuff that's too Christian, you know, like, give them a chance to say no and to turn away from it. But if you're deciding ahead of time that they're going to react negatively, well, how can you be an evangelist? You know, I keep on telling myself that that is one of the keys to evangelization is giving a chance to people to say no. It's, it's one of the keys to, to vocation ministry, you know. Uh, if, if a few people hadn't had the courage to say, Paul, Dre, have you ever thought of the priesthood? You know, uh, I, I would have, I was thinking of it, but I wasn't daring to act on it until somebody, you know, came to me and said, you'd make a good priest. 
you you got to you got to take that bull by the horns. Now, if I again, if I come back, now I look at it as a parish. Okay, I'm in a parish. I'm part of a parish leadership structure and everything. So I ask myself right now in COVID, what can we do to help? So the question now is for our community: What can we do to help our parishioners grow in their in their knowledge uh, of Scripture right now? And obviously, it won't be it won't be by uh, offering courses uh, in in the parish hall. But again, here's where obviously the internet is uh, affording a lot of resources to us. Um, I know I know faith sharing groups that are meeting on the internet now. Uh, Bible sharing groups that are meeting on the internet. I know that uh, there are seminars on scripture. That are being, you know, free seminars, good Catholic stuff that is being hosted there. Are we letting our parishioners know about this, encouraging them to sign on? And, and, and afterwards, you know, saying there was a seminar, who participated? Shall we get together, form a little Zoom meeting and chat about it? I, I mean, this is, there's a whole world of animation uh, uh, around this that we could be doing right now, thank, thanks to the internet. My love for my brothers and sisters, how do we get people to stay in touch with each other? I know of a parish that has set up a phone, a kind of a phone ministry, so that uh, people who are alone uh, are twinned with other parishioners who are not alone, and they can call each other every day just to check in and to say that somebody is looking for somebody else. Do, do, we, have a, do we have a prayer uh, you know, maybe we have a website on our parish website. Do we do we have a section where we can name people in our parish that we know have been affected by COVID, either that they're sick with it or they? Uh, uh, just a very personal example. My predecessor, uh, Roger Bachelier, Archbishop Roger Bachelier, lives in a senior's home two blocks away from the cathedral where I am. He called me uh, this week and said, Paul Andre, there are there are 60 cases of COVID in, in our seniors home and I'm one of them, you know? And I said, how are you doing? He says, my symptoms are very minimal right now. He says, uh, so it's okay, but you know, we're all locked into our rooms and everything. I said, do you mind if I let people know about this? And he said, no, that's okay. So we put it on our website. He called me yesterday, he says, Paul Andre, I've been getting calls all day long from people, he says, it's, it's lifting me up so much. I was all alone dealing with this. Now I feel I'm supported. You know, that's, that's what it means to love my brothers and sisters in the community and to do this for each other. And how can we help our people grow in intimacy with God? Oh, yeah, to grow in intimacy with God. How do we help our people pray? They can't come to celebrate the sacraments as easily. What do we offer? You know, like uh, since we've been in the red zone on Sundays, uh, I've decided not to celebrate mass in front of a on 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 the internet because I feel there's just there's a lot of that there's a lot of that people who want to follow uh, you know a Eucharistic celebration on the net can has tons and tons of choice but I decided what I would do is I would uh, take the text of that Sunday and take time to reflect on each one of them in depth. And out of that um, kind of pray to God, as I would pray, but to pray it on the web so people want to join me uh, to pray that way. And I tell myself it's an, it's an other alternative to help people. Uh, there's a parish I know that rather than have mass, what they do is they're doing a liturgy of the word, but an interactive liturgy of the word so that the members of the community are joining in. Children are leading songs, uh, teenagers are reading uh, intercessions, uh, the, the comment on the commentary on uh, scriptures shared by different people, so that at the same time that it's helping people to grow in their intimacy with God, it's also helping the people connect with each other. You see, this is what I'm saying, you, you use this structure to kind of go over and then you look at the world, you know, so uh, how do I humanize the world? I've always said, and then to, to shine with 
as a, as a community, sorry, as a, as a parish, what as a parish can we do, for example, to humanize the world? Right now, we've uh, discovered in Gatsino, one of the things that we've become aware of in our diocese is the, the isolation of our older citizens. Uh, a lot of them, uh, you know, even couples are, are isolated from their families, people live alone. And so we've learned about this movement called um, Les Petits Frères, which exists, uh, which is quite active in, in Montreal and other parts of Quebec, but is not active in our diocese. So we've decided as a diocese, we've connected with the, with the, with the movement and we're talking about setting up the movement here. We'll, as a diocese, we'll give, uh, we'll commit our resources to helping them. We're not gonna start something else new. We're going to help them kind of expand here. So to respond to the needs of the world. So it's not about Catholics, it's about our society. So, so we've found a project as a diocese that we can help to respond to the, the cries of the poor in, in our society. So as a parish, how can as a parish we respond to the cries of the neighborhood that we're in? What's going on in my neighborhood? You know, what are the challenges in my neighborhood? Uh, there's a parish that's downtown here where, you know, um, the la fonction publique, all the ser civil servants, their buildings are there. The, the, they're not there anymore. Everybody's working from home, which means that all these restaurant owners the restaurants are completely empty. They're going through a panic situation. How can we, if I'm a parish there and all these people are in my neighborhood, what can I do to reach out to them and support them? Am I at least aware of that? And can my parishioners become aware of that? And how can we help our parishioners shine with holiness? It's, you know, and so, so what I'm saying is that to take this model and to look at it as a parish in the context of COVID, I think it really becomes challenging for us. And I've got one minute left and, um, and it's a question that keeps coming back because we say, well, how can we bring our parish to, you know, to move? And it's true because, because we focus, honestly, this is my analysis of it and it's caricatured and it should be nuanced and everything. But because we focus so much on the inner movement as parishes, we've fallen into the trap of being a consumer society, a spiritual restaurant, a way station where people can come and get fed and celebrate the sacraments and maybe have a blessing and and then go on. And we haven't understood that we, the parish as a whole, in a sense, must become a service organization. It's like, let's say, let's say the Knights of Columbus, they're a service organization. But if they just kind of get together to have a beer on Friday nights, they've lost their purpose. And too many of our parishes have lost their purpose. You know, how do you make that change? slowly, slowly, step by step. And you have to realize that not everybody's gonna come along because some people have always, are so used to that consumer model of religion that it, the, the conversion is maybe too hard for them. Two suggestions. One is to help people realize that they are already being missional. For example, when a parent is helping a child to deal with a problem, he's, the parent is being missional. You know, whenever you're focused on somebody else, you're being missional. Whenever you're, you're sharing, uh, you know, your, your hope with someone else, you're being missional. Whenever you react, for example, to a racist joke and say that's unacceptable, you're being missional to help people identify in their lives and perhaps in our homilies, and this I'm addressing to the priests, to help the priests, to invite the priests, not to give them a guilt trip, not to give people a guilt trip, but to build them up and to be able to say, I remember giving a homily once, I saw this, I saw this in my parish, I saw this, and I just want to celebrate that and congratulate the people who did this. So to hold up, to hold up, in front of the whole community, models in the community of people who are trying to live this out. I think this is one slow way of, of being able to 
to bring that about and to be intentional, to be intentional. And now my time is up. One final little comment. Uh, you notice that there are three axes to this. And so often when we speak about new evangelization, we're just focusing on the evangelization aspect. Our Pope is telling us we cannot evangelize if we're not also humanizing the world and if we're not shining with gospel values where we are. So if we're trying to sh you know, share the gospel and, and we're bitter and we're angry and we're frustrated, I'm sorry, it's not gonna work because you're not living gospel values when you're that way. And if you're trying to share gospel values and at the same time, you're not involved in making the world a better place for others, it's not gonna work. Now, everybody has their area of specialty. <laughs> everybody has their charism, but in a way a, a parish has to be the mosaic of all those charisms. And we have to focus on all of them together. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll take that down. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pan Andre, for those words of wisdom. And uh, there were so many insights and so many great questions in the chat. I'm going to trust that the people who are in charge of our, techno of our technology today are going to find a way to cut and paste that into a document so we can take more time afterwards to process some of the great insights and questions and use them in planning future events. Uh, some of you may know that in the past, um, one of the things we've learned about Parish Vitality is that it needs to have a follow-up. It needs to have events that continue throughout the year to make the message sink in and to, and to help us go to the next step. Those of you who get the grapevine every week uh, know Cynthia very well. Cynthia is one of our great communications people at the diocese. So Cynthia is going to give us uh, a few announcements and a thank you to Bishop de Roche and tell us about a few upcoming events so that we can continue this conversation and continue this movement into mission. Cynthia, over to you. Thank you, Father A. Um, so on behalf of everyone here, uh, to uh, on behalf of all the faith communities of Montreal, and uh, also to our brothers and sisters who have tuned in from beyond our diocese, and on behalf of the diocesan team, what a great collaboration over at the diocese, I would love to express our profound gratitude to you, Archbishop de Roche, uh, for the tremendous gift of your time, your insights, uh, especially the important reminder of God's personal and missional call to each one of us as an individual. Um, but particularly in these uncertain times, your message of encouragement and hope. Uh, we're all distracted. Um, I think these this past year has been uh, uh, something that's hit a lot of us uh, in uh, many profound ways. And so uh, that message of hope, I think, has been to be really uh, taken, taking us into the Advent season individually and as a global family. Um, speaking of being generous with this time, Archbishop de Roche is also offering this presentation this afternoon. Uh, in French, and that will begin at 2 p.m. So registration is still uh, open for those of you who might know anyone who will be interested uh, in tuning in this afternoon. Uh, the links will be posted in the chat. Um, and as a reminder, for those of you who are interested in ordering a copy of Archbishop uh, de Roche's book, uh, just tune in to, sorry, just uh, visit the website Novalis Canada, that's novalis.ca, I believe. Um, Martina had put the link in the chat as well. So before I pass the mic over to Archbishop Lapine, I'd just like to bring to your attention a few projects and initiatives that have recently been launched or are upcoming. Um, so as a follow-up uh, to today's Parish Vitality Gathering, um, we invite everyone to uh, take some time this Advent season. Uh, we've organized a lunch hour Lexio Divina um, under the themes of uh, exploring four uh, figures in the Bible, Moses, Peter, Mary, and Mary Magdalene, and how they responded to God's call to them. Uh, it'll take place uh, Thursday, starting November 26th, this Thursday, and uh, four consecutive, three consecutive Thursdays after that, uh, during lunch hour between 12.15 and 1 p.m. Uh, the link for that will also to register will also be um, in the chat. Uh, finally, we have um, we have two two conferences coming up. 
I'm going to start with the um, workshops. Now, today is supposed to serve as a launch for our Parish Vitality series of workshops. In the past, we've traditionally had our conference held over the period of a weekend, uh, but because the areas in Parish Vitality uh, have become quite extensive and we've received a lot of feedback from all of you in, term in the different areas, um, especially leadership, we decided to begin with the topic of leadership um, and exploring uh, approaches in team building, strategic planning and decision making. We will be announcing more details um, in the coming weeks, but that is scheduled for Saturday, January 23rd. Again, the, the same time slot as today from 10 to 12. And also near the end of January, we have a Fratelli Tutti conference that's being organized by the Office for Eng uh, sorry, the Office of Cultural and Ritual Communities. Um, the coordinator, uh, Alessandro Santo Padre, has invited Father Fabio Baggio, who is the undersecretary to the Migrant and Refugee Section of the Vatican. And he will be presenting the latest encyclical from Pope Francis, which was released just this October, called Fratelli Tutti. Uh, so that will be offered in Spanish, but it will also be offered in English on the 31st of January at 2.30. And a French version is also being prepared so if you sign up to the grapevine, uh, that link will also be provided in the chat. Um, you can, um, you'll be able to tune into details that will be provided very shortly. Uh, finally, just a reminder that two initiatives already been launched. Uh, the diocesan um, digital campaign uh, has been launched just recently and you can find us on Facebook and on Instagram. It follows the story of four people in our communities who have found um, extraordinary ways in responding to the needs of their community in, face, uh, in, in light of uh, the onset of COVID. Uh, very inspirational stories. And if you'd like to find out how you can, um, you can support the mission, please feel free to, uh, to visit the link that's provided on the, um, on the chat, but also in the uh, PowerPoint slide. And Le Pont, which many of you are uh, familiar with, is a, a special home for, uh, that also um, is run, uh, is, sorry, is coordinated with a team um, with Alessandra Santo Padre and uh, oh my goodness, forgive me, forgive me for his name. I, okay, uh, Alison, sorry? Arthur. Arthur. Yes, Arthur, that's right, Arthur. The two of them have been really remarkable in welcoming families who are seeking uh, asylum and refugee families. Uh, it's a transitional home and they are constantly in need of uh, all sorts of supplies. Uh, this Christmas appeal that they've launched is a drive, a Christmas drive, um, encouraging each one of you to purchase something that you uh, imagine yourself wanting and desiring. And um, what they will do is uh, they, they, will, they have a, a website up where you can uh, offer that gift to someone that they will match in their, who's living in their home or in their, within their networks who will be in need of uh, such a gift. So if you want more information, you can um, visit www.appimontreal.org. And uh, that's it for now. So again, I'll just post all the links onto the chat if they're not there already. And uh, I pass the mic over to Archbishop McQueen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Monsignor Barandri, for your uh, meditation, reflection, and uh, communication. Uh, somehow the, uh, the diocese, uh, something initiated in the, uh, Anglophone community, a parish vitality vision. At the beginning, it was open doors. Now it's uh, outward bound, and we need the two. And uh, what I've liked, especially in your presentation, is the fact that you, you root every king, everything in Jesus Christ. Uh, the sacraments of Jesus Christ, the word of Jesus Christ, uh, the poor to whom Jesus Christ identifies himself. So in that sense, it's a way to live a baptism, but also a confirmation. So, and it's very precious because somehow it, it, new things, it's not necessarily new things to do new things. It's about renewing our faithfulness to Jesus Christ and through our, the baptism, through confirmation and through love of the poor, we have a way to renew our, our link with Jesus Christ, our relationship of, to Jesus Christ 
and to help others meet Jesus Christ. One of the aspects also that you shared is about uh, everything in faith is about being personal, but also community. We, uh, yes, when we pray at Mass, we say, uh, I believe, but it's everyone who says together, I believe. So it's, it's about being together to, be, to say, I believe. So it's very personal, but also it's very community-wise. It's very a relationship. It's very together. And in that sense, I think it's a precious contribution that you make to our reflection and the mission in the, in the diocese. And I want to invite all of you to enlarge more and more the sense of being together. Together might mean, might mean the team, Irish team, and, and it, it is. It might mean uh, those who are at mass on some days with the parish team, and it is. But it's also the whole of the parish, whether people come to mass or not, whether they, they're baptized and they're away from the church, they're part of the we. They're, they're part of the togetherness. So how do we involve people in a way that everyone sense this duty, not only to be this call to be rooted in Christ, but also this, this call to be on a mission, to witness to the love of Christ. And this, we live in a particular area, pandemic, uh, Christmas, December and Christmas, so somehow we need to I, we need to renew our faithfulness to Jesus Christ to be more at, outward bound than ever, to be more open doors than ever, and since we cannot do it the usual ways that we know, well it's a unique time to discover new ways, to be to open our doors, open our hearts, and to be outward bound, to be near people, and. Uh, Monsignor Paul André spoke uh, many times about the poor that we need to learn to love and to love concretely. And uh, I suggest to you, and he also mentioned it, many people are suffering for, uh, from solitude, isolation. So what, what are we going to do this December to reach out to those who are alone? We need to do something. And I, I'm sure, I'm sure that what we do during this pandemic will have an enormous impact on the afterwards. In terms of the people we'll be reaching out to, in terms of what we'll, we'll discover, how to reach out to people. And we need that time. God is giving us that time, I would say. Uh, it's not God that causes the pandemic, but he has the power to use everything to his glory. So. God is give us, giving us that time to renew our faithfulness to Jesus Christ, our sense of mission, our care for the whole of humanity, because everyone needs to discover that he is, through Christ, uh, in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the beloved child of the Father. Everyone needs to know that. So I want to thank you, and I conclude with a prayer that I take from St. Paul. We we'll always ask great prayers. So St. Paul Ephesians, uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. I make a few changes to adapt to our context. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we bow our knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner self, and that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we together, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all that we may ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And may God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God.
Blessed be God forever. Merci, Monseigneur Lépin. Merci, Monseigneur Du Rocher. Thank you to everybody for being here. In case we didn't get a chance to thank them before, thank you to the technical team, all the people who worked in the background, all the planning committee, uh, both for this morning's event and this afternoon's event with the Monseigneur Du Rocher. I think we have been very blessed. And most of all, thank you to all of you who've come to participate. At one point, I saw we were over 120 participants, a great way of connecting with each other and a great way of um, launching us into this new phase. So, um, uh, Isabel, are there any final messages before we let people sign off or are we ready to go? Happy Feast of Christ the King. Yes. Viva Cristo Re. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody. God bless you all. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at future events.